You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth, the show that is honest, reveals the facts, truth, and statistics, and does not mess around. Follow me, Taylor Phillips, on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Email me at TaylorGatorPhillips14 at Yahoo.com. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter at EdSmith313. And go to our website at MichiganSportsTruth.com. Also like our Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth, and join our Facebook group with the same name. The Michigan Sports Truth podcast on Spreaker is also available Available on iHeartRadio and SoundCloud. Also a subsidiary of Sports Radio Detroit, thus available on iTunes and Podbean. This podcast is particularly not for entertainment purposes, and the views expressed by the host of this podcast are opinion-based. However, they do not come without facts, research, statistics, and truth, whether other people like it or not, and no matter how harsh or complicated it may be. This is the Michigan Sports Truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Michigan Sports Truth Seekers, and welcome to the Michigan Sports Truth episode 247 on Spreaker. I'm Taylor Phillips along with Ed Smith via Facebook Messenger. How are you this week, Ed? Well, feeling certainly a little bit better than the horrible, shitty sports weekend that we all suffered through, through including multiple, uh, uh, multiple Detroit teams. But uh, other than that, I had a very fine week. Good. Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get the toughest of all out of the way, included, which is actually the Lions, plus a couple college football notes. I'm gonna recap the uh, college basketball week that was, as well as the Pistons and the Red Wings. Might discuss a little uh, Ken Holland news too, uh, as Jeff Moss uh, returns to the DSR to the Detroit Sports Rag, writing his articles. He he has written three of them, the latest involving Ken Holland and his Ponzi scheme. And finally, the Tigers uh, prepare for spring training, and um, Al Avila is uh, denying something. He's playing his edit, that he's playing his edit to uh, his owner, Chris Illich. But first off, Time to stop drinking that Lions Kool-Aid, folks. Season's over. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Because the Lions got pounded 26-6 by the Seattle Seahawks at CenturyLink Field last Saturday. And the Lions offense never scored a touchdown, evidently. Just two field goals. Too many mistakes again. A couple critical non-calls by the officials. And karma bit them straight in the ass, and uh, fans uh, and players keep spewing out Detroit versus everybody because it's still everybody else's philosophy, because because the fans always disrespect the NFL referees, and so do the players, and they don't blame themselves when it's actually Detroit versus Detroit, none other than than themselves. Now, total yards look like this. The Seahawks, 387 total yards, 177 rushing. You are pathetic! The Lions, just 231 total yards, 49 rushing. You are pathetic! Time of possession, Seattle, 36 minutes, 39 seconds. The Lions, 23-21. You are pathetic! First downs, Seahawks 24, the Lions 13. You are pathetic! Penalties, the Lions 7 penalties, 68 yards. The Seattle Seahawks 6 penalties for 40 yards. 
The Lions were 2 of 11 on third down. You are pathetic! The Seahawks, 9 of 16. No, turno no turnovers whatsoever in the entire game. Um, the, I mean, the Lions got, got dominated in most categories bes besides all that Drama, all that same drama, that all that same soap opera drama that the Lions only uh, uh, only uh, continue to uh, talk about after the game and during the game as well. When they when they don't admit that they're at fault, and and Ed. Um, it just totals up uh, another massacre ending to another Lions season. Even though it was good, it was always a disappointing ending. Always the, the disappointing end. It sums up practically the experiences of every Lions fan for the past, what, going on now officially six decades now. So, if you're going by history, this wasn't a surprise to you in the least bit whatsoever. Um, fortunately, though, if you're more of the optimist, you're thinking, wow, uh, you, you go from having a chance to win a division title and go from hosting a playoff game to going on the road, getting your ass kicked, and your season ending in miserable fashion yet again. You know, it's it's, it's kind of almost heartbreaking or beyond heartbreaking to see in this past decade uh, notable snake bitten franchises like the Boston Red Sox and Chicago Cubs finally rise up, overcome their own bullshit or whatever, and finally win, you know, ascend to the promised land and win championships, yet we can't seem to get a, get out of our own fucking way. Um, however that may be, it is what it is. But um, in terms of how this whole game itself bottled down, it came down to... to uh, in my opinion, these three were, were so notable things. The Seattle Seahawks just firmly, early on from the get-go, established a run game and didn't let up. Uh, Thomas Rawls, who I think, obviously, fans in this area would know all too well about from his time in college playing not only for the Michigan Wolverines, but also Taylor for your Central Michigan Chippewas. He had a hell of a game, rushed for, rushed for about 160 yards on the ground by himself. Um making great cuts, showing great bursts of speed. And now, granted, some of it was against the, the offensive line, setting up good holes, um, whereas Detroit's defensive line was having the wrong scheme out, because I saw a video that showcased, you know, the one thing that always harmed Detroit, which led to big run running, uh, rushing games against them, uh, was where the wide nine, which is primarily used as a, a pass rushing uh, technique is used against them because all the open gaps and holes uh, at the interior of the line at least big gains in the run game. Uh, so that played in a factor. Not to mention the fact there was a lot of missed tackles from secondary and especially the linebackers uh, that could have, you know, that turned a a potential four or five yard gain into a ten to fifteen yard gain uh, in a in the snap of a finger. Um, so that was one. Thing that was, just, that was clearly evident uh, that Seattle was able to use to, to stem the establish in the run game, whereas Detroit, you know how it is with Detroit. We're, we're lucky to get the 50 yards, let alone 100. Um, Zach Zenner, once again, uh, I would say this, what, since the, the, the Dallas game and you know, the Green Bay game, now this game, that was three straight games where early on he was utilized. He was productive and efficient enough in terms of helping us move the ball down the field. Um, and then the second half, whether it was trying to play catch up or whatever, he just didn't get, uh, get the ball wasn't given back to him. Now you could say, was that a bad move on coaching or it was just trying to change things up because you're trailing, you're falling behind and you know, you're really your best realistic shot to try and win is through passing more. I get that, which leads into the second point of drops, 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 drops. The Lions picked a horrible time to catch a case of the Butterfingers. Uh, they had 28 drops this regular season. That was one of the uh, top five teams with the most drops in the NFL. Only two drops total behind, uh, I think it was San Francisco, I believe, who had 30. Um, and that 
that came into play in this game in the worst way. Um, whether it be drops by your usual reliable, uh, the usual suspect, I should say, Eric Ebron or Anquan Bolden, which was very uncharacteristic. Uh, another thing that's uh, that was uncharacteristic of him, I'll get to in a minute. But those kind of things that will kill, aside from penalties and taking sacks, are drop passes that will kill drives, stall drives, and just, oh my goodness, ruin missed opportunities and chances for you to possibly do something. Um, it just didn't happen that way, and it proved to be costly, very costly. Um, and while after the drops, another thing that har- harmed us was uh, self-inflicted wounds. Besides the drops, were penalties, primarily personal fouls committed by, of all people, of all damn people, Anquan Bolden, guy who is a long-term NFL veteran, been, been in the league for over 10 years now. He should fucking know better of what to do not let his emotions get the best of him, especially in a key situation like this, on the road, playoff game as an underdog. You can't put your team in a bigger hole than what they already now by committing these dumbass self-inflicted penalties. No excuse. No damn excuse at all. Yeah, that's and just being paper thin skin. I'll, I'll, yeah, but still, he's, he's a veteran. He's been in there, what, t- uh, 12, 13 years now? You should fucking know better. Yeah, that, that, that's yeah. Some some veterans uh, let their emotions get to them. And and Bolin, for example. I know, but still, you got you got to think smarter than that as well, because uh, the Lions were facing an uphill battle trying to get good field position against this Seattle's Hawks defense. While Grant may not be as great because there was no Earl Thomas, but still pretty damn good when you have the likes of Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and Bobby Wagner and Michael Bennett out there. It's still pretty damn good defense. So as you could, you had to muster up, take advantage of any field position you could possibly get and not harm yourselves with stupid, dumbass offensive penalties that set you back instead of moving you forward. Mm-hmm. That's right. Once again, and the, line- the last thing I'll get to, and the la- I'm sorry, and the last thing as part of my, you know, the recap is once again I just this further uh, ratified or vindicated or validated, I should say, you know, my thoughts. I'm sure your thoughts, and a lot of people's thoughts on why in the world is Jim Caldwell still the head coach for this team? I know, right, he's being, he was announced beforehand, he's being brought back for another year. Um, it was an extension, because apparently that is the last year of his contract on this deal. Uh, but it was almost a bad omen when you announced before the game that, oh, no matter what happens, we're bringing him back next year. And then in this game, he commits at least one, if not two or so, uh, horrible mistakes. The one most obvious one, in my opinion, um, I don't care what some may say, oh, you know, there's not very, not a good chance you might get it and you give the ball back to Seattle in a good field position. But my opinion is, is this, when you're late in a game, it was about eight minutes to go in the game, you're down by two scores, your season is on the line. To me, you got to go for it. You got to go for it in that situation. See what the hell happens. Um, you could say, oh, well, but, you know, you're giving the ball back, back, back to Seattle. It was so. What in terms of trying to trust my defense? No, their defense has been had been getting shredded and gassed all damn day long, especially through the running game. Uh, field position was not going to change that either way. So it was either going to go be going to be go big or go home. And instead, Caldwell decided to go home. He decided to tuck his tail between his legs and went absolute white flag pussyfoot mode and decided to punt the ball, which was infuriating beyond all reason. <laughs> But yeah, he's coming back next year. Go fucking fit. Yeah, that's because of the fucking Ford family that decided to bring him back, and Bob Quinn, the general manager. I don't know if the I don't know if the Fords are telling Bob Quinn to uh, bring back Jim Caldwell, well, or uh, they let him make yeah. his own yeah, decision. I'm sure Quinn noticed. I'm sure Quinn. And listen, he's not. I won't have him completely exempt for this because at the end of the day, he is the general manager. 
So at the end of the day, you know, unless he's getting a direct edict from the ownership, fine. But I'm sure he was kind of fooled by the illusion of, of saying, oh, wow, we've made the playoffs in two out of three years with this man as our head coach. But he, he chose that, apparently chose that to have a short-sightedness or the fact that, listen, this is a man who constantly, constantly uh, makes bad decisions, uh, always, for some reason, likes to hang on to his timeouts as if they're going to be rollover, uh, carryover cell phone minutes. And I don't know. I think it's... Disagree with me if you, if you can on this, Taylor, but it seemed like in the majority, if not every game this season, in the second half, Jim Caldwell was getting outcoached severely in the second half by the other coach making adjustments and him either making not enough or not making any at all. If you want to be considered a head coach in this league, you've got to find a way to make some type of adjustments, what good or bad, whatever it, whatever it is, so you can learn from it and apply it to the next week. Jim Caldwell didn't do any of that shit the whole year, and it, it, it proved, it showed itself. Um, the only reason why, like I said, that we even got this was most of the fact of Matthew Stafford's performance throughout the year until he got, you know, he hurt his finger. Uh, because I can't credit Jim, I cannot credit Jim Caldwell whatsoever as all oh, the big reason that the Lions got nine wins and got the playoffs. No, that was that was because your fucking quarterback pulling a rabbit out of out of, out of our asses at the last second, uh, eight out eight out of those nine wins. That was the reason, not the comatose head coach, who apparently is only emotion is clapping. Yeah, and, and if you sum it all up, that that. That becomes like, um, you, you know, just the worst playoff team in NFL history, and in in and in, and in franchise worst history worst as well. Period. Worst franchise period. For God's sakes, this is now marks the what eleventh straight wild card loss on the road, the most ever. Uh, I haven't had a wild of. Uh, Obviously, haven't had a playoff win since 1992, and of course, have not had a road playoff win since 1957. This is one playoff victory in 60 damn years, and I'm sick of it. Yeah, I know. It's, um, yeah, it's uh, the most pathetic drought that any NFL franchise any NFL organization, any NFL team that has had to go through through this because uh, because of their awfulness, because of the Fords running this organization to the ground for so many fucking years, 60 years now. Since 1957, the Fords, uh, when the Fords first uh, bought it. It was 63 when uh, Bill yeah. Ford Sr. bought it, but I still get your point. Yep, thank you very much. That was six years apart. That, that was uh, quite a long time. So, uh, speaking of Jim Caldwell, um, by the way, the, the box score, Stafford, eight, 18 of 32 for 205. Zenner, 11 carries for 34 yards, not much. Marvin Jones, four catches for 81. Not bad. Golden Tate, six for 54. Tahir Whitehead, only three solo tackles, 13 total. Russell Wilson, 23 of 30 for 224 and two touchdown passes. My guy, Thomas Rawls, 26 carries for 161 yards. Good man. Doug Baldwin, 100. 11 catches for 104. Good man. If you notice, by the way, people, even though it was a big uh, part of it, we're not blaming the officials here. Yes, they made horrible dis- uh, calls yet again that hurt the Lions. That should not have been a pass interference on Detroit. That should have been an offensive face mask on Paul Richardson in the end zone. Wasn't called the right way. Nothing we could do about it. Um, same thing with, in my opinion, a block in the back. That was missed on Russell Wilson. Um, there's at least one number, I'm sure. Uh, oh, by the way, yeah, uh, T.J. Jones was more than likely interfered with on a third down. 
uh, which the, the rest ruled the ball was uncatchable, so therefore he was uh, there was no flag. But if you look at the picture, there's a reason why that ball is uncatchable because TJ Jones was clearly being interfered with getting his arm held and whatnot. But even still, through all that, uh, we can't blame the refs for the drop passes. We can't blame the refs for our own self-inflicted wounds. And we can't blame the rest for the fact that, uh, what, on third downs we couldn't get off the damn field, which led to Seattle converting on 9 of 16 and having the advantage in time of possession about, what, 16 minutes plus? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we, yeah, we can't blame that any of that on the officials at all. That came down to them executing and us being piss poor. Yeah, and if you keep and if fans and players keep blaming the referees for for every loss, then um, they they don't have they, they they don't have any pride at all. The Lions also always use their hashtag one pride and their other hashtag Detroit versus everybody, just like all the rest of the fucking Detroit professional sports teams do: the Pistons, the Tigers, and even the Red Wings. Um, this, this town is, this town is a bunch of, full of a bunch of cowards who are sports fans who always keep blaming the referees, especially Lions fans. Uh, uh, the fans that, that support a team that has won only one playoff game since 1957 and, and no, and, and no road playoff game since, since that year, it, it's just, uh, Absolutely uh, hilarious and pathetic, and and just uh, cowardly by those idiots. I don't mind the meaning. Of the, I don't mind the meaning or the motive behind it because I do sometimes. I think Detroit does this as a city as a whole gets a little bit too much of a bad rap, and, and by essence, is that underdog finds himself in that underdog type of role. Uh, but you can't use that as your crutch when, like, when you as a team or any of your teams do not execute on their own. You can't use that as a crutch. I agree with you on that. But uh, I've got no problem with it in terms of you know trying to use your own personal motivation in real life or trying to get out of bad get out of a bad situation, and move on to a better one. I got no problem with that. Yeah, well, let's put it this way then: fans and players keep using Detroit versus everybody as their crutch. And that's, and that's, uh, that's, the, that, that's what they, that's what they always do. And, um, they, so they'll just never shape up. This is what was that? In some instances, it's called for this instance. It was clearly not. Right. It was Detroit versus Detroit. None other than themselves. Gotta, gotta shape up or ship out. So, um, the Lions season is over and everybody can at least breathe for a minute. And, and, uh, if they, if they want to watch the, the rest of the NFL playoffs, fine. If not, that's fine too. That, that's not our prerogative. I, I, I still love watching the NFL despite the uh, horrible officiating, which happens, um, to, uh, every other NFL team. To all NFL teams, actually, but let but let's move on to college football. Now, former Western Michigan Broncos football head coach PJ Fleck, now the Minnesota head coach, he has hired f- now a former WMU offensive coordinator, Kirk Siraka. To the Minnesota offensive coordinator position, so um, he, oh, oh, only the Bron- uh, the Broncos have only the defensive coordinator left, and um, it seems as though Western Michigan Western Michigan is almost leaving their legacy behind. Is that true? Well, it's it's early to tell because this is just the immediate aftermath. But sometimes when you ascend to the heights that Western, excuse me, that Western did this season, there were there are cases where 
you get the test of, hey, let's see what you can do it now without your protection, your palm tree, your shade tree. This instance, it'll be TJ, uh, it'll be PJ Fleck and the other coordinators that you may decide to bring along with him. That's, that's what it comes down to. It's, you know, it's not easy. It's sometimes not right, but as that is the reality. Uh, of how business works and how sports works of how if a coach sees an opportunity for green pastures, he's going to jump at it. And I don't blame him. That's right. And, and then, um, to Michigan football. Touchdown, Michigan! Cornerback Jabril Peppers has declared for the NFL draft and the Wolverines will miss him. And um, they'll have to go without him now. And um, that, that's one of our. That's going to be one of our ten questions at the end of this podcast. At the end of this episode, what were your thoughts, though? My thoughts is where. Well, I kind of expected this. It would have been a surprise to me if he had actually stayed for for, for another year. Um, I think I see it as as. Uh, he probably feels his stock probably won't be higher than it is right now. The amount of hype and attention that he got with his play this year. Some of it a little bit overblown, but, so, but most, most of it uh, uh, very deserved. Um, and I'm sure seeing not just what happened with all these other players either attending or skipping or getting injured in bowl games, but, uh, but also on personal experience, not just happening to him with the hamstring injury before the Orange Bowl, but seeing his own teammate, Jake Butt, tear his ACL during the game. So I'm sure all that played into his mind of, wow, okay, do I take a big risk, come back for another year? This isn't basketball. This is a completely different sport of where on any single given play, any single given moment, you got to suffer a cataclysmic injury that, obviously will knock you out for the rest of the year, but could hurt your draft stock. And if your draft stock gets hurt, you probably won't get that much money, i.e. a first round or second round pick as compared to a third, fourth, or fifth round. Um, so in terms of financially and whatever the case may be, I think Jabril made the right decision. Um, is the NFL ready yet? I can't say for sure. I think he's athletic enough where if the right team or the right situation finds him, he could be uh, a very valuable player and commodity uh, or asset to use in certain plays, packages, or whatnot. Um, so I have no problem with it. I wish him the best of luck. Yeah, but it had to be inevitable because uh, Jabril Peppers uh, was already NFL draft bound. Um, Jabril Peppers uh, trying to showcase uh, his uh his NFL skills in advance. So, speaking of Michigan, for three, yes, sir. Their basketball team has uh, been in a rut lately. They lost at home to the uh, Maryland Terrapins last Saturday, seventy-seven to seventy, late afternoon, and then just last night they got pounded by the Illinois Fighting Illini in Champaign. 85 to 69. Illinois is good at home, but list, but Michigan let them slip away and didn't play with any urgency after Illinois pulled away with a 14 nothing run before halftime. One big key factor to consider all this, um, besides uh, the usual Michigan not doing enough with their jump shots and getting completely outmanned in the paint or whatnot with rebounds, um, bench play. Michigan was outscored. Illinois had a plus 19 advantage in terms of bench off the bench points. Uh, primarily one player in particular, Kipper Nichols. Uh, before this game, he only had a season total of two made baskets and two offensive rebounds in 18 minutes played. Against Michigan, he scored 13 points on six of nine from the field and by himself had more offensive rebounds with five than Michigan had as a team with four. That is just completely inexcusable and flat out embarrassing. Um, you know, it's, oh my goodness, 
that, that was a factor more than anything else that led to uh, Michigan losing this game in the embarrassing fashion that they did. Um, now, when you get factor at, compare that and factor that in what we saw against Maryland and now what this whole season is looking like, um, we're now looking at a one in four start to conference play for Michigan. And it's it doesn't get any easier, unfortunately, I would say, because you have ranked whiskey got to go on the road to face a ranked Wisconsin team um, coming up in terms of your schedule. And then after that, look at this three, look at this four game stretch. Why don't you? Or five, if you want to, if you want to be more specific. Uh, home against Indiana is going to be booked in by by Indiana. By the way, home against Indiana, and then uh, two tri- two uh, meetings with MSU. One at the Breslin Center, the other, of course, home at Chrysler. In the middle, sandwich in between all that is Ohio State. But the way they've been playing, compared to the way we've been playing, we could get rolled. And then, of course, like I mentioned before. Uh, you, bu- you book in that, that five-game stretch with a visit to Assembly Hall to take on the Hoosiers again, which is a place that rarely anybody wins at if you're a Big Ten team, especially Michigan. Um, doesn't even get easier than that because I left out. After that, you got to face Wisconsin and Minnesota again before you finally get a gimme against Rutgers. So we're looking at a stretch here. If they don't get their shit together, they may have, what, still have only one, if not maybe two, conference wins uh, by the time the Rutgers game rolls around. If that's the case, you pretty much you have to bank on doing a, an outstanding job in the comp, Big Ten Conference Tournament to even garner you a shot at, at the uh, the national tournament itself. Um, as much as I like, admire, and respect John Beeline, I think the discussion, if you want to call it debate or whatever, it's got to come up of whether or not he deserves to be in the hot seat. Yes, I believe he does. You know, appreciate you and love you for the the, the job that you did building this team from the ground up, getting us to the Final Four in the national title game in 2013, the next year back to the Elite Eight. But since then, since you haven't had the, the, the myriad of options and great players that you've recruited, like, you know, a Mitch McGarry or uh, – Glenn Robson the third, or Nick Stauskas, or Trey Burke, Tim Hardaway Jr. Now you're relying on three three star guys, or maybe even two star guys, to, to outplay their worth and value. You're left with the situation that you have, which is a, a a struggling and stagnant Michigan team. Uh, that on the surface, oh, they're they're eleven and six, but look at some of the teams that they've beaten. Howard, okay. Uh, Memphis State, Kennesaw State, okay, Furman, Little Sisters of the Poor, and when they face legit teams like South Carolina, like Virginia Tech, UCLA, Iowa, they get their asses kicked. So, and obviously here against Illinois uh, in the game before against Maryland. So it's it, it does raise the question of yes, I think there's some be some at least some discussion of Jim John Beeline being on the hot seat. No, I'm I'm not saying fire him, but there's got to be a discussion of hey, he needs to do better to improve um, the team and the program as a whole. This season looks to be unless they make you make a turnaround mid season, then what what do you do for next season beyond that? In terms of hey, if this keeps continuing, do we need to start looking the other direction? That's the discussion that I think should come up. Not saying oh, let's just fire him outright. No, let's just. Wait out just a little bit more, but still discuss and bring up possible backup plans as to what we can do in case that worst case scenario does arrive. Yeah, and I have to agree. And um, that's because Michigan is off to a slow start of the Big Ten conference uh, schedule. Um, that's uh, and that's uh, got got to be uh, mentally. Uh, uh, frustrating, if not demoralizing, uh, but um, but uh, mentally troubling for the Michigan Wolverines basketball team. And uh, John Beeline does not like to see that, but uh, he's got to take some ca- accountability in in um, his head coaching and, and trying to uh, make plays and. And, and whatnot. not. 
So, speaking of, we uh, transition to the Michigan State Spartans. Valentine for the win! Yeah! They lost to a very good uh, Penn State Nittany Lions team, 72-63. to Payne Banks led the way again. It, it, was, at, it was in Philadelphia, and uh, the fans were uh, favoring the Penn State Nittany Lions, but um, Michigan State uh, was, was shooting like crap, and, Penn, and the Nittany Lions took advantage of it. They won by nine. And, and then the uh, Michigan State Spartans went back home and rematched with the Minnesota Golden Gophers, and, and they crushed them, 65-47. to 47. They, they were shooting uh, pretty much lights out in that game, and they held the Gophers to just 47 points. Talk about playing some defense. They had to defense change up their game. Defense and toughness, which seems to be what the Wolverines are lacking. Yeah. And the Michigan State Spartans have only their one blemish in, in the Big Ten Conference record, 4-1, and one, I believe? Yep, 4-1, and one, the lone loss being the Penn State. And to be honest, you know, they made as close of a game as, poss- as they possibly could. The, only thing, the one thing that really sunk them was they had a, a not-so-good start in the first half. Uh, but at the end of the first half, they were outscored. They were, they were pl- uh, Penn State had a 12-point lead, uh, scoring MSU 44-32. Now, obviously, adjustments were, were made by Izzo and crew because in the second half, Penn State could only muster up 28 points compared to Michigan State's 31. But like I said, unfortunately, it seemed like the damage was already done. You look at some of the numbers in that one, Michigan State with four more turnovers, 10 less rebounds, um, and shooting, like you mentioned, like crap, just barely over 40%. Um, from the field as composed compared to Penn State's 46% from the field. Um, it was it was all those, and you're on the road. Yeah, it was a good formula for, for a probable loss. Um, now, converse that or contrast that with what we saw against Minnesota. Uh, they got out to a hot start, um, and, one, and one big part of that was the returning, the recently returned Miles Bridges um, went off had 16 points in the game, all that in the first half. And that was the spark that was needed to motivate, pump up the crowd, pump up the teammates. And they just, it was on a roll from there. They finished with, like you said, one reason they were able to play great defense. They held out Minnesota to just under 19% uh, from three point shooting um, and utilized their toughness and their uh, tenacity inside the paint by being the team to out rebound them. Uh, and Michigan being plus 13 in rebounds, for instance. Um, so, yeah, the, those staples of what you want to see from a Tom Izzo team were on full display, uh, especially in that first half with, with Miles Bridges. So him and Nick Ward, amongst other players, finding their groove, obviously showing much better chemistry than what we're seeing in Michigan. Um, they're, they're looking in good shape right now. Look to be, be on a bit of a bounce back from a pretty rough early uh start to the season when they were in suffering some bad out of conference losses. Yep, but uh, the Spartans have a have a tougher schedule coming up. They are at OSU Sunday at one thirty on CBS and then they're off until next Saturday when they head to Bloomington and play the Indiana Hoosiers. Like we pointed out last week. That, that's gonna be another tough game for the Michigan State Spartans. So, so there, so there you go. Now, now for my uh, Central Michigan Chippewas, they are now zero and three in Mid American Conference play. Yet they are ten and six, but um, they lost to uh, two good teams by four, both by four points. They lost to the Northern Illinois Huskies in DeKalb, Illinois, eighty-seven, eighty-three. Then they went back home and played a 12 and three Akron Zips team at McGurk Arena and lost 89-85. The Chippewas were off to a hot start, but uh, Akron, but right before halftime, finished strong with a 20, 22 to three run to lead 49 to 41 at halftime. 
and and Central Michigan just could not keep up or even tie the game. A little bit of static there, but Marcus Keene uh, starting to pick it up, pick it back up a little bit. He he scored thirty three against those Zips. Braylon Rayson continuing his hot streak with twenty eight. The Chips are home against the Toledo Rockets this Friday. That's tomorrow at seven. It's going to be televised on CBS Sports Network. Then on Tuesday at 7, they are in Muncie, Indiana, playing the Ball State Cardinals. Now for the now we transition from college basketball to pro basketball, and uh, we survey the Pistons here. Left side line, three, and he answers. They start their West Coast road trip with a with a crazy 125-124 to 124 double overtime win at Moda Center against the Portland Trailblazers. KCP, as Justin Spiro pointed out on Twitter at Darko State News, the editor-in-chief of GregHenson.com, not an impact player, but but he sunk the game-winning three. And and uh, he, uh, he's been hitting uh, quite a few threes per game, the one being the game winner with... Uh, Nine nine and change seconds to go, 9.8 seconds to go, if I remember correctly. And then the Pistons, led by as many as 16 at Sacramento, they blew it and lost to the Kings 194 because Stan Van Gundy went back to using Aaron Baines in the last five minutes after using Boban Marjanovic in more minutes. And uh, Aaron Baines continued to uh, foul people and try to get a little erectile dysfunction of his own. Just like Justin Ablocator uh, for the Red Wings uh, uh, two nights ago in Chicago. We'll we'll get to that momentarily. But um, What's that? Yeah, we'll get to that idiot in just a moment. Yeah. (laughs) Marcus Morris... uh, Here's another key fa- factor that's uh, bringing the Pistons down. He's not producing much offensively. But again, the defense lacking. They they uh, they allowed two C.J. McCollum game-tying threes to force two fucking overtime periods in Portland when they shouldn't have. They should have kept their eyes on his ass. In those two times, CJ McCollum was a red hot shooter. Getting the ball, yet they somehow everybody knew who's getting the ball, yet they somehow still went behind him. Pure insanity, and and the, the piggyback on that, uh, the perimeter defense killed him again. Which one of the reasons why Sacramento was able to lead that comeback? Demarcus Cousins, one of the best big men in the league, but was <laughs> apparently decided to turn to Steph Curry and hit at least what two or three uh, threes of his own. Uh, in fact, for goodness sakes, he was four for five from three-point land uh, in that yeah, game, man. especially a couple late in the fourth quarter um, that sealed the win uh, for Sacramento, which was completely disgusting and, com- and completed a whole collapse. Um, like you mentioned, Taylor, Bovon not getting enough playing time. Now, believe it or not, he did have more minutes per se than Baines, but still, even six minutes for Baines is far too many that could have been used towards Boban Marjanovic or uh, you know or someone else because Boban when he was in there was was doing the work getting four re- four rebounds and getting us eight points uh, as opposed to not getting any time at all in Portland so I don't know what was Stan Van Gundy's issue yes we know Boban is not that type of mobile or fast enough player we can run up down the the floor, but in terms of height, size, what he gives, what he does for you in the paint, and what what other intangibles that he may possess, far outweighs and far outproduces Aaron fucking Baines by a mile. Yeah, Aaron Baines should never play basketball again. He he doesn't know how to how to play cleanly. He doesn't. He can't rebound in traffic, and uh, he keeps fouling people. 
and he can't and, and he can't even hit a hook. Liability. He can't. He's a tremendous defensive liability, as been proven in the past. Yeah, but yeah, but he still can't uh, hit putbacks either. There's there's a lot of flaws with Aaron Baines because uh, all because he's a big guy and, and with a lot of hair on on his head and on his face, looking like a reject Seamus. Yeah, more like uh, an Irish caveman or something like that. Oh God, that, that is disgusting. Get up, just just decline his option, please, for next year. Don't e- don't even bring him back. If if you're stuck with him for the rest of this season, fine, I'll live with that. But but don't bring him back next year. Period. It's time for Bolban to get more minutes, especially in the clutch. Well, you hope. Remember how Stan Van Gundy wisened up and decided to finally cut Josh Smith loose. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to waive Aaron Baines midway through the season, but if he if he sees that the writing's on the wall and he doesn't bring him back for next year, uh, that'll be very keen and ideal for for a lot of us. Because Bobon, yeah. like you said, Bobon deserves more, and he's been proven more uh, when given the chance. Yeah, Stan Van Gundy should already know that. Right now, Stan Van Gundy keep keeps playing Aaron Baines in the clutch minutes like he did in Sacramento and it and it cost him when the Sacramento Kings took the lead. So uh John Lure day to day with a sore right knee. He's been an up and down player. Not sure if we need need him or not. Um I think we still need him. I think he like I said he'll he's be more he will be more valuable uh, than Aaron Baines, I think who yeah. knows? Maybe this injury uh, was is what had been plaguing him a little bit before he was officially diagnosed. So maybe once he gets healed up, gets some full rest, comes back better and recharged, uh, then he could probably perform up to the standards that some of us are expect were expecting to see when we when we signed him this off season. That's true. So the Pistons have uh, have a really good s- schedule coming up. Tonight on TNT at ten thirty, they tip off with the Golden State Warriors. Then on Friday, Friday yeah, on ESPN, yep, yep. Uh, then on Friday at ten thirty on ESPN, they're at the Utah Jazz. Then there's then the, then Sunday at nine thirty, they're back on Fox Sports Detroit's airwaves at the Los Angeles Lakers at Staples Center, and then they return home finally. Wednesday at eight against the Atlanta Hawks to start a three game homestand. So uh, good for the Pistons. Well, the way to this team is home. playing, we can. Yeah, but the way this team is playing, we can just almost count. We can just chalk up the Golden State game as a loss. Focus on how they can finish this road trip with at least another win. Uh, most likely coming up against either the Lakers or the Jazz. Um. Because, again, Golden State is going to be pretty damn tough to beat, especially now when they're going under this their own issues of finding their own chemistry and whatnot with the addition of Durant. You know, you got Draymond Green getting pissed and yelling at Durant on the court. Um, they may, might be willing to, uh, more than happy to take out their anger or whatever on the Pistons because they just, remember, they just finished blowing their own big lead. Not just the Christmas Day fourth fourth quarter fourteen point lead against Cleveland, but just recently blowing a twenty four point lead um, against the Memphis Grizzlies. So I'm sure they're going to be looking to take out their aggression and anger on the poor pathetic Pistons, um, especially in the national audience on TNT. So um, the thing that for Detroit, you might have to focus on say get the most out of what you can out of these these other two games against Utah and and, and L A. And hope you don't finish the road trip with a one and four record, which would be oh, completely, completely mind numbing and infuriating in some cases. Yep. So good luck to the Pistons on on that schedule. Now, the Red Wings. <laughs> they got thrashed by the San Jose Sharks six to three. Because um, the goaltending and the and the defense could not 
could not get the job done while Anthony Mantha and Athen- Andreas Athanasiu continued their hot streak. And Mantha scored again in Chicago, yet the Red Wings uh, lost in Chicago to the Blackhawks in overtime 4-3 to at United Center because uh, with 15.2 seconds left in Justin Ablocator's and Mike Green's return, Justin Ablocator committed such a stupid boarding penalty in his re- and um, after after the uh, Duncan Keith scored an easy power play goal on a one timer on the four on three, Justin Ablocator continued to argue with the referees. And 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 defend and plead his case that it, it was a clean hit. No, it was definitely a boarding call, Justin Ablocator, you, you fucking idiot. You, you absolute abomination. Is that what it's is that why the fuck Ken Holland signed you to a to a fucking seven year high high paid money contract, forty million dollars or or some or some shit? Oh, no, he was just rewarding his hard work and grit on the ice. What a fucking embarrassment. Yeah, Ken Holland's, a, Ken Holland's even more idiotic. It, it, yeah, they're both more idiotic than, than, than ever. That's, um... <laughs> that's just total... That, that's just total embarrassment. Applicator, uh... Uh, even Ken Holland had to argue on the, on, on the ice if he was a hockey player. You're just a crybaby, a coward! And uh, that, that would have been twice the embarrassment for the Red Wings, who are last place in the Atlantic Division. <laughs> so, um... As I pointed out, Anthony Mantha and Andreas Athanasiu continued to be red hot. Athanasiu and Mantha uh, both scored in San Jose. Mantha scored in Chicago. Andreas Athanasiu uh, uh, continues to rack up the assists as well. Th- those are those are two key factors that Ken Holland is starting to comprehend. Is already starting to comprehend. Uh, keeping them on the team, and uh, they, they they just seem to click. That's I, I guess that's part of uh, Holland's uh, plan to stay the course and uh, try to uh, get as much goal scoring as the Red Wings can. But uh, Holland's get, just forgetting one thing: the defense, the defense in hockey terms, and the goaltending until Jimmy Howard returns from his injury. Well, yeah, you can't really do much with the goaltending because, like I said, you're already in a bad spot with Jimmy Howard's injury. And Coro, I thought, has had done a decent enough job. Um, some, of, some of the issues, like I said, when I, I don't blame entirely, put the blame on him. Uh, I you know, remember that the shutout he had against the Kings the other night was quite impressive. I think he's been fairly adequate in terms of stepping up to this role in Howard's absence. So goaltending is, is, is just waiting on Jimmy. Uh, I do agree with you on other points as well. Another thing, though, and this is re- really where I, I got to attack Jeff Lash on this. Yeah, Holland may put the roster together, but you put the lineups together as the head coach. Um, when one unit that you put together as a coach is power play. Why is Tomas Tatar not on the power play when you got to deal with Sproul and Sheehan, uh, excuse me, or N- Nielsen and Vanek or Nyquist or Larkin, Anthony, C. and Mantha. Some of those are good players, but one of those, one of the key options of, that made that gives you a little bit of bright light in your horrible, shitty power play is Tomas Tatar, and yet he's not on any of the units. I don't get it. Yeah, Tomas Tatar. Uh He's got nine goals on the year, I believe. Yeah, that that's that's why he should be on the power play. That's why Jeff Blaschel has to start has to start using him on the power play instead of Riley Shahan, who has zero fucking goals and six assists on the year. Shahan has been terrible. Obviously, Shahan used to be a good goal scorer. 
uh, the, 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 the past two years, but now look at him. He's just uh, shooting the puck wide of the net and at, and, and the goaltender's chest, just like Gustav Nyk- Gustav Nyquist has more often. That's why Gustav Nyquist has been struggling as of late. Gustav Nyquist uh, has to stop shooting the puck at the, at the goaltender's chest or belly, one of the two, ha- has to start using those holes, the five hole, the stick side, the glove side, top shelf, any, any side of the goaltender. But stop shooting it right at the goaltender, for Christ's sake. Please. And that goes for all the that goes for all the players that are not named Anthony Mantha and Andreas Athanasiu. Dylan Larkin continues to shoot the puck wider than that. Even uh, Franz Nielsen. And, and and Franz Nielsen recently was uh, selected to the All Star Game, the NHL All Star Game, when he hasn't produced much. Yeah. Compared to Anthony Mantha, who almost equals his output in far fewer games played, that's because uh, he wasn't what well, he was still in Grand Rapids for a better part of the. Uh, first quarter of the season were finally being brought up. So you can make an argument that probably Anthony Mantha deserved that spot more so than Franz Nielsen. Not a knock on Nielsen, it's just a, a, a laughable um, excuse or uh, example of how underused Anthony Mantha has been this season. That That's true. Not only Anthony Mantha, but Andreas Athanasiu could have... Uh received an all-star vote, along with Thomas Vanek. Vanek, Vanek has been red hot. He, he continues to uh, light the lamp. Uh, along, right, along he was one of our best offensive players before he got hurt. So, it's good to see he's, he's, he's uh, remained constant and steady with that, even coming back after injury. Yeah. Yeah, still Darren Helm is out. And that, that's actually a good thing, because Helm... Hasn't produced much, but um, anyway, Nicholas Cronwald injured as well. He hasn't come back. That's good too. Don't need him. Red Wings are at the Dallas Stars Thursday at eight. That's tonight. Then they're home against the Pittsburgh Penguins Saturday at seven. Back at Joe Louis Arena after a long, grueling road trip to start a uh, three-game homestand. They're home against the Montreal Canadiens on Martin Luther King Jr. Day at three. They're home against the and then they're home against Boston, the Bruins Wednesday at eight on NBCSN's Wednesday Night Rivalry. And then they're back on the road against the Buffalo Sabers Friday at seven. So, uh, again, you can hope for the best, but it start, it's starting to come to a point now where in terms of best interests and long-term success, you'll probably rather the Red Wings, not just miss the playoffs, but as Jeff Moss, you know, started to point out in terms of possible hypothetical simulation situations, we'll be able to just tank and just get the number one draft pick. Yeah. And... That way, when you you know you have a steady piece in the future already set in stone, uh, whenever you decide to bring him up, uh, it goes fits well with the whole out the old end with the new, leaving the Joe going to the Little Caesars Arena. Another out the only one the new would be getting a number one draft pick and possibly who knows best case scenario, Ken Holland no longer being the GM. Yeah, and think about this: if they tank, they also can get rid of Steve Ott, who was. Um who hasn't produced at all this season, only one goal and uh, two, oh. two or three assists this season. Oh, oh. man. Jeff Blashell continues to use him. That's disgusting. I almost threw up. I almost threw up there. Uh, say that again. Oh, that is disgusting. Yes, I almost threw up hearing that. 
Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> man, I I know it's just it's just another uh, example of why Ken Holland and Jeff Blaschel are are awful. Chris Illich, uh tells them what to do, and and uh, same way same way he tells Alavila what to do with Brad Osmus, which we'll get to uh, um, pretty much uh, soon. In fact, we're gonna we're gonna get to that right now. That one is long gone. Alavila, you found out that Alavila, the Tigers' general manager, that, that he he denied that he follows the edict to Chris Illich. Did you find that in an article? Well, it's not so much what well, I'm looking for it right now per se. Uh, in terms of, you don't even have to look. For an article to look at what the current roster looks stands at right now. Um, there could be some creeds to that, or it could be just a, a, a temporary, temporary, temporary slowdown for what could be a bigger picture. This was the the, the, the one period of where okay, potential hot zone uh, shopping sprees, fire sales. Another key potential time frame to look at would be the upcoming the trade deadline in July. That's assuming that the Tigers are still in good contention. Um, one second. I'm sorry. By the way, while I wait, let me announce that the pitchers and catchers report on February 14th. That's Valentine's Day. And then four days later on the 18th of February, the rest of the squad joins them. So uh, spring training is... Uh, Less than two months away. In fact, it's uh, a month away before they, and then and then they start preseason on February twenty eighth. So uh, go to Tigers. There, there is a little article, but like I said, the, the fact that now I think it could be saying he's not following edict now. That's not uh, suffice to say that maybe he was following on at the beginning, hence them trading Cameron Maven for no damn reason. But, as of now, you can say the whole, okay, I'm not following anything because you're not doing anything now. Like I said, wait and see what happens when we get to July or whatever, and if this team is still in contention or not. If they're out of contention, look for a sale. If they're still within striking distance of either a wild card spot or even the division, you would hope they would be wise and stay put. Yeah, and uh, it's just going to be the same, and uh, it, it, it's not. It nothing's going to nothing's going to get better for the Tigers. I, I, I'm afraid that that's my gut feeling. Gut feeling, sure, but you got to remember this team did get plagued by the injury bug last year. Yeah. Not just the uh, uh, valuable hitters, but their pitchers as well. Um, you, if you think if my, if Jordan Zimmerman is uh, at least above adequate, you know, not precisely his April, May side of self before he got completely turned to the shits, but at least something similar or close enough where he's not horrible, but he's not too great. Factor in Verlander still performing, the reigning rookie of the year, Michael Fulmer, and guys like Daniel Norris and Matt Boyd as well. The starting rotation could be quite solid. Same thing applies to the uh, to the batters as well to the bats as well, assuming we get another reliable center outfielder. Hopefully Austin Jackson, because he's still available, like I pointed out right after the last podcast, the last episode. You did miss that name, so that could be a good name to pay attention to. I mean, shoot, you brought back Alex Avila, who's to say you won't bring back Ajax. <laughs> hey, why not bring both back, huh? Re- regardless, huh? BRB bringing back the band. Yeah. Yeah, hashtag bring back the band. <laughs> so, um, that covers everything. Uh, and, and now it's time for 10 questions. Are you ready for this? Absolutely, Taylor. Go ahead and let him rip. It's time for 10 questions on the Michigan Sports Truth. Question number one, if Lions defensive coordinator Terrell Austin leaves, how will the Lions move on? Well, if you, that's 
Texas, that's a big F. Um, I'm not sure if that'll be the, the crippling difference as to where they perform better or worse next year. Because uh, I think even with Austin at the helm, as the coordinator, their defense well, were not particularly that good or even great or even good. Um, yes, they got timely turnovers. Uh, in some instances, did a great job of holding opponents under 20 points. But look what happened at the last game of the year. Look at the teams that they played and look how much their defense performed. Uh, gave up 42 to Dallas, 31 to Green Bay, almost, you know, gave up 30, 26 to Seattle, not to mention 17 uh, to the Giants. Sure, not a high score, right, but still uh, not performing well on third downs, not getting the constant stops, um, forcing punts. You know, the turnovers can get, turnovers can only go so far. You need to do other facets and whatnot, and the Lions just did not perform that way defensively. So, it's uh, to me, it doesn't strike me as a hit or miss uh, as to whether or not to wear Austin as their next year. Because they have other things to worry about and concern themselves about with improving with the talent, not the coordinator, i.e. getting another defensive uh, uh, pass rusher, Figure out what to do with not necessarily, not necessarily the, line, the linebackers, but improve your depth with the cornerbacks. I've been saying for years, drop the cornerback for God's sakes. This was even be a good time to do it, in my opinion. Yeah. Question number two: Can the Lions sign quarterback Matthew Stafford to an extension? I think they can. More so, more so because of the fact that. They have to know. The front office and ownership, they have to know. We've already lost Sue. we already lost Calvin. Uh, this is essentially it for us. If we want to have fans keep coming to our, our games year after year, we need to keep Matthew Stafford as long as possible, even if it means overpaying or whatnot. Uh, to me, uh, it's a no-brainer because without him, you don't get to the playoffs, period. You don't even get to... The, the five wins, not let alone nine wins, without Matthew Stafford this year. So yes, you pay the man, you do whatever you can to do, keep him here. Yeah, he was. And I all- think they should. Hopefully, they were ready. Yeah, he was almost uh, the the best quarterback in the league. He was the best quarterback in the league to begin with, and and he started to tail off a bit. He was he was not quite elite against the the good teams. Yet when it came down to it, when the Lions tried to hold on to their NFC North lead, they they couldn't they couldn't hold on and they couldn't win it. Matthew Stafford uh, still played his ass off, and um, and uh, that that's all he could do. The rest of the team uh, let him down in the end. Not to mention him, him injuring his finger right at that, uh, right when the, the tailspin started, with the losing streak started. He may not admit it, but I think that finger did play a factor. May not have been a big major factor, but it played a role nonetheless. Yep. Yeah, that that was his dislocated finger, his dislocated middle finger, his uh, torn ligaments. That 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 that's got to hurt, obviously. Uh, the, the Lions uh, had uh, Jake Rudock as their backup, activated to the active roster from the pa- from the practice squad. They could they could have used him for at least for five minutes and let Stafford heal his uh, dislocated finger. But anyway, next question. Question number three: What are the chances the Lions' defensive coordinator tell? Terrell Austin leaves the team and becomes a head coach of another NFL team. Back to Austin. Well, again, kind of a similar question to the, similar to the first question. I think it's it's a little bit low. Um, this wasn't as a stoutly performing defense as it was a couple of years ago, i.e. because you don't have Ndamukong Sue or Nick Fairley um, to make things easier for you for your defensive line. Um, and like I mentioned before, the way the defense performed at, the, at that stretch, the final stretch of the season, that could be a red flag a little bit. Some teams need for a head coach just to say, oh, wow, if you let this happen, how can we trust you with a full year? Um, and again, I don't think Terrell Austin's bad, but I think he still he would still have some stuff to work on for his own, um, whether it be 
the right schemes, having the right players in on, on key situations, that type of thing to where you don't see your defense getting gashed for play after play after play, talent or no talent. You can't see a defense perform like that at the end of the year when you're trying to lock up a playoff spot or a division title. So I would set, I would probably say there's more probably a more than likely a good chance Sir Austin will be back with the Lions next year. I have to agree. Next question. Question number four. How will the Michigan Wolverines fare without Jabril Peppers? Well, I would say this with him. I think they would have been considered a heavy favorite to not just win the Big Ten, but make the playoff for next season. And without them, in addition to the other players that are either leaving for graduation or whatnot, especially on defense, makes that road a little bit more difficult. But you still have some guys like a Mike McRae, uh, Rashawn Gary, uh, from your two guys that could be real helpful for the development of your front seven to where you may need to rely more on your front seven uh, because, you know, your secondary may not be as good next year. But we'll see what happens. Um, we've been seeing a lot of good surprises from Harbaugh's first two years. And at the secondary... I think it's safe to say it'll take a little bit of a step back next year because you're not just losing Peppers. You're losing Channing Stribling and Jordan Lewis and Monte Thomas. You can't just replace that overnight. So I would expect the secondary to take a little bit of a step back next year. Hopefully not too much. But with guys like Rashawn Gary and Mike McCray at the front seven um, and the opposite of the recruits that Harbaugh's getting now, Michigan Stevens should still be all right. They won't be the world beater that they were the majority of this season, but they should still be relatively decent for next year. Next question. Not to mention the recruiting class uh, with, with Jim Harbaugh, too. Question number five, do the Michigan State Spartans need still need Ben Carter? Because uh, I forgot to mention he in an article he was 100% done for the season. The Spartans are seeking an unlikely sixth year with him. Your thoughts on that? Do the Michigan State Spartans still need Ben Carter? Uh, um, well, I would say... I'm not sure. I would probably lean towards no, because in my opinion, you needed Miles Bridges back more than anything else. Um, and you've seen what effect that has had on the team since he's returned. Um, so, and obviously when guys like Nick Warren and whatnot are still developing, the fact that it ended with Miles Bridges as well, and how Izzo how, does a great job of you know, developing his players, um, I would say more so it would be an added good bonus but a, a make-or-break type of, you know, deal-breaker. Um, no, I don't think that would be necessary. I think getting Miles Bridges back was more important than anything. All right. Next question. I think I may have to agree with that one, too. Question number six. Should the Pistons keep playing Boban Marjanovic more and bench Aaron Baines all game? I wouldn't say all game, but there's got to be some minutes in, especially if John gets in foul trouble. But hell yes, Bobon should be getting more playing time. You saw what he did when given the opportunity. No, I'm not saying he's going to go 15 and 19 every every single time, but he'll give you reliable consistency compared to what Aaron Baines is. Uh, I see Bobon as being a better defensive option with his height and size and a more versatile player because not just with him being able to score and do what he can to paint, uh, every once in a while, he can surprise you with a good pass by feeding to a good feeding to somebody at the rim uh, because he's being so right. More than like being double teamed, you see open player near the rim. He's able to fit the ball in there uh, for an easy two. So I would say, by, by beyond those reasons alone, Boban should be getting more time. It's, it's just obvious. So yes, that, that's true. <laughs> Next question. Question number seven, should the Pistons demote Marcus Morris to the bench? Possibly, especially when you see that Tobias Harris is producing and still contributing, even when he's coming off the bench in his own right. Uh, maybe Marcus will need some soul-searching of sorts uh, as he tries to figure out what the hell's going on with him. But, 
you know, we see a player like Tobias Harris who's still producing, even though he was clearly giving, I guess you say, being the odd man out. Makes you wonder, hey, maybe we need to switch things up again, see where we need to go, because Tobias has been so consistent. He plays like a star anyway. I would argue, yeah, put him, yeah, put him in the spot, have Lure be your four, have Mook come off the bench, and see if that will affect him in a more positive manner than what it's doing right now. Next question. Question number eight. How hurtful is Justin Ablocator's return to the Red Wings lineup? I'd say very hurtful and, in fact, uh, paralyzing. Yeah, it's hurtful the fact that he's 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 more than likely not going to be able to ever back up uh, that contract that Ken Holland gave him. And B, he's still committing the dumb penalties that I've seen him commit since, what, 2010, 2011? This is five, six, seven years later, and he's still doing the same dumb shit. <laughs> yeah, he, so it is detrimental to the team in an extended role. Yeah, it, it, Advocator never stays out of the damn box, penalty box, that is. And that, that, leads, uh, that leads us to question number nine. Next question. If the Red Wings miss the playoffs, can Ken Holland finally comprehend it and wake up to do something to turn this franchise around? Maybe, uh, but I'll, I think the only thing that would be more acceptable is if he's no longer the GM, period. If you want to say he gets the promotion, gets kicked upwards, becomes president or whatever, team president, and some, someone else becomes general manager, fine. But for his sake... Possibly because you think, oh my goodness, we missed the playoffs. Playoff streak is what we need to do something. Da, 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 da. That could create a sense of urgency where he does something, um, probably changes course from the, from the usual diet of what he's been doing in the offseason by signing out of uh, past their prime, washed up veterans instead of relying more on the young talent that's being produced um, through your development system. Yeah, and keep in mind, Ken Holland has one year left on his contract after this season. If they miss the playoffs and tank for that for that draft pick, maybe, maybe just maybe he'll have one chance to uh, make it all right. And finally, next question. Question number ten: How much faith do and should you have in the Tigers in 2017? this calendar year. I don't think I have much faith as long as Brad Ostomus as the manager, despite all the talent that the, that the Tigers have on their roster, as long as Ostomus is their manager, Avila is keeping him and Chris Illich is telling them what the fuck to do. I, the Tigers are going nowhere anytime soon. I will uh, submit and say, uh, or uh, I'll give you that point with the wild card being Osmus for sure. Um, but like I said, the injuries did play a factor in terms of how we performed and in, in hurting our depth and players that we need at, at the right, right moment. So if we cut down on the injuries, um, that will be one helpful thing. Uh, now, who knows, maybe Osmus have shown improvement. He could surprise all of us in that case. Um, that's really the only thing. But other than that, other than that, I do have some f- hope and faith that the Tigers will probably make another push towards the playoffs next year. The only wild card is Brad Ausmus. I'll give you that. But with injuries, hopefully with health of players being more uh, upright as compared to last year, and you see better returns from guys like Jordan Zimmerman and Fulmer and whatnot, you don't see a regression from guys like Michael Fulmer. Um, you should be in a good spot to contend for, this, for, a, for a wild card spot. Um, and, you you know, we've seen in recent years, all you need to do is just get in and see what happens. Because we have certain places, certain players in right spots and pieces that can make us, you know, a potential, a potential scary team to look at in a short series. Uh, we just got to get there. So, to me, it comes down to can we stay healthy and will Brad Ausmus not be too much of a detriment? But I still have, maybe that's me being the optimist, but I still have some hope that the Tigers could at the very least uh, contend for second place in the division and at the at the same time get a wild card spot. But how do you think they'll do in the postseason? That's the other question. Well, that 
it depends on who they match up first. Uh, who, who will be the first series matchup? Is it going to be the play-in game or the wild card series? Because play-in game, one game on the line, you know, I would still have some confidence if you're going with Verlander or even Fulmer or Zimmerman. Um, in terms of series, I would still like my chances as well because you can face any of those those three guys guaranteed in a short series, not to mention the Daniel Norris. Because like I said, in terms of getting in, our pitching should be good enough where we just got to get a damn hit. Who knows? Maybe bringing back Lloyd McClendon would be would be beneficial in that regard. Uh, but, you know, I can't say how we would do in the postseason because we don't know who we'll be facing yet. We don't know if there's an opponent or what. But if it, it all comes down to our matching up, our strengths and weaknesses matching up against theirs and try to make the best out of the situation of the matchup. Yeah, the Tigers do have to stay healthy. Jeff Moss even pointed that out uh, at least a couple times. Um, but uh, it also detriments on how Brad Osmus uh, manages this team, like he did in 2014 when they got swept by the Baltimore Orioles in the American League Division Series. He he didn't he uh, he he went with Java Chamberlain in that game instead of uh, using Anibal Sanchez in the bullpen. He could have used David Price in either Game One or Game Two. Instead, he decided to use. Price in Game Three when the Tigers' offense sputtered, and and uh, Osmus uh, lowered the bases for Hernan Perez after after bunting, just like he did in 2015 in a regular season game against the uh, division rival Kansas City Royals, who went on to, to win the World Series. Not denying or disputing any of that. It's just that for compared to what we saw last year, what could help us out this year, stay healthy, don't mm-hmm. fire sell, and if maybe if if uh, Osmus can surprise us along the way, give us a, a surprise or two, we should at the very least be able to contend for a wild card spot. We have the potential, the talent, the payroll to at least look for a wild card spot. Is what I'm saying. That, that that's true. I, I just. I just uh, I just doubt Osmus will surprise us in any way. Uh, he, he has he has progressed know, a little that's bit. That's the big but... question mark. I get that. That's the big question mark. Yep. So we'll that, just have to see what happens. Yep. So that clears our ten questions segment for all the listeners and fans out there. If you want to answer those questions, just replay the episode and answer them in the comment in the in the comment bank below this episode. That wraps up episode 247 of Spreaker's Feed on the Michigan Sports Truth, and I'll talk to you again next week on episode 248. Looking forward to it, Taylor. Take in and take care and stay safe till then. Yep, the roads are nasty out there. Everybody drive safe. So, before I sign off, I want to remind everyone to share this episode and our entire podcast on social media. Have their friends share that as well. And follow me on Spreaker as Taylor Phillips online at Spreaker.com because I want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth podcast here on Spreaker is in search of local advertising sponsors. If anyone has a business that's interested in sponsoring this program, you can follow Sports Radio Detroit on Twitter at Sports Radio Debt, that's Sports Radio D E T. And send them a direct message or email them at sportsradiodetroit.com in the contact section. Also like their Facebook page and join their Facebook group. And finally, find their podcast available on iTunes and Podbean. For Ed Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow us on Twitter at DT2Phillips and at EdSmith313. And like our Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth. And join our Facebook group, The Michigan Sports Truth. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for thanks very much for listening and drive safe TTFN Tata for now. Oh, yes,